When Jacqueline Dupre came to dinner, I asked her what her favorite dish was, and she said, Dover sole and garden peas. Well, she may have been the 20th century's most important cellist, but it seemed to me at that moment she was just a girl from the English countryside. I'm Virginia Eskin. Join me as we listen to the late Jacqueline Dupre and enjoy her incredible musicianship on A Note to You. Jacqueline Dupre was a child who couldn't resist music. She was born in 1945, and already at an incredibly early age, she heard her sister play. Uh, Hillary, the older sister, was a pianist, and she wanted to do that too. Well, that happens with a lot of sisters, but with Jackie, something really special happened when she came in contact with the cello. I have to read this quote from a recent book that's just come out by a woman named Elizabeth Wilson. And before that, there was a very interesting biography about 10 years ago by Carol Easton. And both of these women knew Jackie, studied the cello, and so they have insider views. This quote says, I love the physical thing of being on the earth that bore you. I have the same feeling when I walk in a beautiful place outside that when I play and it goes right, because playing lifts you out of yourself into a delicious place. Well, she certainly... That's the hallmark of her playing. She coincided with playing the cello. The cello was her friend. The cello was her soul. It was her uh, confidant. And at some point, she did turn on the cello because she realized that all the touring, all the loneliness, all the trouble of being a concert artist also belonged to the cello. And there's a movie out currently that paints a kind of a maybe questionable uh, picture of her life. But a lot of that is true what happens in the movie and it certainly is a colorful life and anybody who is a musician or even people who like music there's a there's a whole feast to learn about what went on in her in her um, in her life I had the opportunity to get to entertain her when she came to play at Tanglewood back in about 1975 and she was doing what was really her signature piece the Elgar concerto and she was able to take a piece that had been sort of uh, resting in oblivion and maybe because it was by a countryman I don't know or whether it was just I think it's a romantic piece it suited her and she remade the way that piece was played nobody had come along and injected the kind of extraordinary passion and fervor and then of course she met Danny Barenboim the pianist and then conductor, they got married. A lot of people said at the time it wasn't a marriage, it was actually a merger. And the two of them made extraordinary music together. It was white hot heat. And they came as a couple to Tanglewood. She was probably beginning to experience the very beginning of the disease that was going to take, take her down. Because I remember she complained of being tired, and we all thought, well, she's tra traveling, it's hot in the summer and everything. But the point of why we look at her life is the fact that she not only buried herself in playing the cello, but it, it's really, it serves the music so well. Her pain and the strain of traveling, and then in the end, her passion, she poured it all into the music and into the playing. And in doing that, she took us on a great ride. Listen to the way she begins the concerto. It has like a little intro. And within probably less than a minute, she goes from uh, fortissimo all the way down to triple pianissimo. She shifts, she slides, she breaks all the rules in playing the cello, and she gets away with it because it's just so incredibly beautiful. <laughs>
That was the Elgar Cello Concerto played by Jacqueline Dupre with the London Symphony Orchestra conducted by Sir John Barbaroli. So did you hear what I was talking about? She manages to really make short shrift of any of the problems, and cellists, I think, have a lot of innate problems. The instrument is bulky. There even used to be a standard way that women were supposed to play the cello. When she was growing up, there was the masculine way, which is spreading your legs, and then there was the feminine way. And you were supposed to tuck your knee under your, um, sort of (laughs) under your leg, so that way you would sit side saddle. Of course, we've come a long way, and nowadays women can wear pants, and so spreading your legs to accommodate the cello is not even an issue. And she was really a pioneer in terms of making the cello a glamorous instrument, and she had beautiful dresses made to go with her tall, stately look, and she as a girl, had very short hair. And at some point, she grew her hair, and it became like a mane, and she would toss it very effectively. And between that and sl- and slashing at the cello with her bow and these beautiful jewel-toned dresses, she really set the world on fire. And this kind of intensity, of course, has a big price. It has a price on the artist, and it has a price also on people who play with you. And she went through pianists, Uh, a little bit like Kleenex, she finally came up against two American um, pianists, actually, Stephen Bishop, who'd been a friend of mine when I was a girl studying in London. He came from San Francisco, and I came from San Diego, and he used to come over and practice on my piano. And he met Jackie, and they formed a very strong collaboration. I'd like us to listen now to how she leads Stephen on an absolute white-hot race like Grease Lightning, in this Beethoven D major sonata, which is one of the most difficult works of the five. The other ones are very playable. This is the the gnarled one. It's very difficult. It's a little bit reminiscent of the Hammer Clavier sonata for pianists, and it's about the same opus 106-108. It begins with this sort of clarion call. I just exaggerated, and believe me, when you hear Jacqueline playing it, (laughs) it's even more exaggerated, and that's after a recording, and there's a certain degradation that happens. When you record, it's very, very intense, and then when it goes through all the levels, there's always a little diminution, but even on this recording, it makes your hair fall out. Listen to Beethoven's, the first movement of his D major cello sonata, Dupre with Stephen Bishop. Thank you. 
Wasn't that great? The Beethoven Cello Sonata, first movement with Jacqueline Dupre and Stephen Bishop. And as I listen to it, oh, it's just so intense. She dares to be very tender. And then about a microsecond later, she's savage. And you can hear her sniffing. She just puts so much of herself into the playing. And she regarded, I think, the cello as almost like a speaker because she plays it as though it's in dialogue, always with the pianist or the conductor. She didn't even need to talk words. She just, the cello was her voice. And sometimes I do feel that she is excessive. You can hear the vibrato breaking. It's just like um, in sound when there's, you know, it cracks and it gets a kind of a nanny goat quality. But that's because she's She's really just wringing this feeling out of the out of the note. And it's better to have that than to have some kind of lackluster sound. The next piece owes great homage, of course, to Pablo Casals. It was his signature piece, the Schumann A minor cello concerto. And he used to groan and moan a great deal. The engineers never knew what to do with it, in fact, because the mics would always pick it up and she sniffs. You don't hear her groaning. And I used to always think it was because the cello is such a hard instrument to play that these sort of little gasps and sighs uh, sort of escape. Let's listen to the last movement, which is in probably the favorite key for cellos because it's A minor. It's set, it it um, rides well. It's down. You can play on the inner strings, the G and the D, which are the most expressive. Cellists don't like to go up on the A string because then they go up into the stratosphere and they have to go up on the fingerboard and they ride up on their thumb and it's like hanging onto the edge of a cliff. They like to be back down where it's comfortable, up back near their neck. And the cello concerto stays back in that range for the most part. And the last movement doesn't have as many big melodies but it has a beautiful quality of the writing. This and I want to include it because it, has a, it shows her playful side because not only could she be very, very emotional and very passionate, she's really like a little girl plucking flowers here.
was Jacqueline Dupre playing with her husband, Daniel Berenbaum, the Schumann Cello Concerto. And could you hear how her little fingers go down on the fingerboard? You can hear that kind of slapping sound. Well, of course, the engineers can't remove that because that's part of her intensity. She's just attacking the cello. And there's a wonderful quote from a fellow cellist, Misha Maisky. He said, the sound emanated not from the instrument when she played, not from the mind, but from something within, her heart or the soul and it was united with the instrument. And I think that's true. No cellist seemed to just breathe, and it was almost like a, the way a singer takes us on a wonderful ride. Well, I'm Virginia Eskin, and today we're listening to one of the most remarkable cellists of the 20th century, Jacqueline Dupre. If you want to write to us, our address is a note to you, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. And when you write, let us know what the name of your public radio station is. Our program, a note to use, made possible by the friends and alumni of a Northeastern University. Well, in trying to really provide all of us with a nice sampling of her recording oeuvre, let's listen to a Haydn concerto. This was not the famous D major that everybody played. This is one that was discovered in the mid-70s. I can't remember by whom, but I remember it really turned cellist, uh, really created incredible fervor at the time and excitement because there's so few concertos for them to go on. So let's listen to the more unusual C major one, the last movement, with her playing again with the London Symphony and her husband conducting. <laughs>
beginning to see what I talked about, the sort of white-hot heat. She broke every rule in that Haydn concerto, and with her husband aiding and abetting her, the early music people would absolutely choke because she vibrates on notes, she breaks chords, she speeds up, she slows down, she's a romantic sort of stallion, and she gets away with it. It's all part of Jacqueline Dupre's great charm. The next piece that really, I think, is a window on her world is by Dvorak, and it's it's a small piece. It's called Silent Woods, and so beautifully played and heartbreakingly. It's just touching. It, it really is on a different scale. 
the way she invites us into her world and also into the world of the music, she does, again, some very idiosyncratic things. When you're a string player, say a um, music festival like the one that Rudolf Sarkin had in Marlboro, Sasha Schneider was a famous violinist of the Budapest Quartet, and he invented the word schmuckadoris, and it meant when you made a schmuckadoris, you schmeared. And there's so many great Yiddish words, you know, schmata and schmear and schleid. And, but the schmuckadoris meant that you came down on the string and you did what a tenor does when they, somebody like Pavarotti sings a note and he there's a little catch in his throat. And we, as, as the listener, we think, oh, he was so moved. He's almost crying. And he makes us cry. And string players have the same ability. We pianists don't, unfortunately. We don't have that little weapon in our arsenal. Listen to the way she slides back and forth. And under less gifted hands, you'd have to get out your uh, vomit bag. But the way she plays it, <laughs> it just really reduces us. So here we have Daniel Barenboim conducting the Chicago Symphony with sweet little piece, Silent Woods by Dvorak.
Dvorak's little piece called Silent Woods, played by Jacqueline Dupre, Chicago Symphony with Daniel Barenboim conducting. And wasn't it beautiful the way she trailed in the beginning? It was like slow dancing. And as I was listening to it, I was reminded of when one watched her she was so ethereal looking. Who knew that she was sweating into this special woolly vest that she had to have made because she had a real problem. All that intensity made um, perspiration sort of run down her body and it unnerved her and it also ran out of her fingers. She always was wiping her hands on her dress. Uh, and she had this special quality, which I've spoken of before, and when you analyze it, there are ways to imitate it and cellists do, of course. She had a way of capturing the, the um, tone. She sort of like took no prisoners. She just slashed the bow down and capture the note, no vibrato, straight tone, and then microsecond later, add the vibrato. That's a very, very ballsy thing to do and very, very dangerous because the tone can be, it can break or it can be very ugly. But that was a uh, one of the, the more dramatic ways she had of starting phrases. It was either that way or the way she did then just in the Dvorak very gently and she sort of would trail almost behind the note. We're going to end the program with a really good performance of what cellists kind of dread because the beginning of the piece starts almost like Beethoven's fifth. It starts almost like on a rest. The Saint-Saëns A minor concerto goes... <laughs> nightmare, in fact. The conductor slashes at the orchestra. The cellist sort of has to be ready to just jump right out of the box and get on with it. Listen to the way this piece, it just absolutely is like a canock to the head. <laughs> That's all a minor concerto. <laughs>
Well, that was the first movement of the Saint-Saëns Cello Concerto played by Jacqueline Dupre, New Philharmonia Orchestra, and her husband was conducting, Daniel Berenboim. I hope you've enjoyed sort of t- getting to know her playing and certainly getting to have a greater appreciation of the extraordinary range that the cello can sound like. She died in 1987 after a 14-year ordeal with MS. She was only 42, and it's a very, very sad story. She had a, she was like a comet. She sort of burst on our musical scene. She changed the art form through her great, great passion and her extraordinary technique. And she was born, of course, with a very large gift. And her parents had the wisdom to give her the good training. And whether or not we agree with all the kind of tawdry mm, tales that are circulating now, We have to certainly pay homage to the incredible gifts she had and the wonderful musicianship, and it really is a testimonial to how beauty is its own reward. Thank you, our engineer for today's program, Jane Pippick. Our producer is Alan McClellan, and I'm Virginia Eskin. A note to you is made possible by the Friends and Alumni of Northeastern University, and it's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio Boston. Thank you.